I call this meeting to order. This is the regular meeting of the Northfield Public School Board. Today is Monday, October 25th, 2021, and the time is 7 p.m. We are present this evening in our school board meeting located meeting room located at Northfield Public Schools District offices. This meeting is being live streamed and recorded, and the recording of this meeting will be posted on the district website as soon as possible. I'd like to welcome those in the audience who are here to observe the board doing our work on behalf of our students, we appreciate the time you took to be here this evening. A special welcome to Northfield High School Global Studies students who are here as part of their community connections assignment. As a reminder, Northfield Public Schools requires all people over the age of two to wear a face mask while inside a Northfield School District facility, including during school board meetings. Um, Dr. Hillman, there were some items in the table file. Yes, this evening we had uh, a few additions to the table file. Uh, we had a, an updated report for the superintendent's operation in COVID-19 update. It just has the most current COVID-19 cases per week graph that's available from Rice County. Uh, we also have some appointments and some increase, decrease, change in assignment. And that is all we have in the table file tonight. Okay, thank you. Um, if there's no objection, we'll add these items to the agenda as we move forward. Is there a motion to approve the agenda as presented? Moved by Jeff. Is there a second? Second by Amy. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, we now have an opportunity for public comment. This is an opportunity for residents, business property owners, parents, guardians, students, and employees of the Northfield School District to address the board. All comments to the board must adhere to the guidelines set in place by policy, district policy 206 regarding public comment. You will be gaveled out of order if your comments are not in compliance with these guidelines. Please address the board from the podium after being recognized by board chair, identify yourself and if you represent a group. We require that you limit your remarks to three minutes. You are not allowed to yield your time to another person. It is expected that members of the public will address their remarks with civility and respect. Personal attacks by anyone addressing the board are unacceptable. And please keep your mask on when speaking from the podium. The board has allotted up to a total of 30 minutes for public comment at regular school board meetings. Um, Vice Chair Amy Gorwitz will be monitoring the speaker's time. She will signal each speaker with the time they have remaining at one minute, 30 second and 10 second intervals. Again, please make your remarks as brief as possible, but more, no more than three minutes. Um, I will now begin to call up those who um, signed up to speak in the order in which they signed in. So we welcome first Dr. Felicity Enders. Welcome Dr. Enders. Thank you so much, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm speaking tonight because a few weeks ago, I had the pleasure of hearing the high school and middle school principals speak about uh, equity targets regarding diversity, equity, and inclusion. I thought this was fantastic. They were looking at student satisfaction for underrepresented students. Um, I'm a professor of biostatistics, and this is an area that I'm passionate about, and I've published in, and I've made some mistakes, and so I wanted to give some advice to try and help avoid some of those same issues. Um, the first is that looking at these numbers is really important. That's great. They also mentioned that connection with students personally was really important. I was surprised that that was a new thing, but I thought it was wonderful. Um, I had two concerns. The first was the use of the term minoritized. That's a term that suggests that it's something being done to the student that they will have no control over. Uh, in terms of replacement terms, this is a fraught area. I would suggest not using people of color or BIPOC because there are some people who we would think of as being part of these demographics who don't think of themselves as fitting that. The term that I would suggest instead is underrepresented. It's got less association with it. The underrepresented students had targets for both the high school and middle school. I thought that was really good in general. Oh, oh, sure. Thank you. So it was really good that there were targets for underrepresented students students as a group, but I had the impression that they were being looked at as a group only, not as separate demographic categories. Now, I recognize in Northfield, there's not very many people who are underrepresented. That's probably part of the reason for this. 
but I would hope that Asian students are being considered as part of this group. So Asian students in Northfield face considerable issues and discrimination, but nationally, there is a very different stereotype for Asians than for other groups. And so looking at them all together may give what combined to look like a, a reasonable assessment that would be different if considered separately. So again, thank you for looking at this and please just look at the numbers carefully. Think about your future. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Enders. Our next um, speaker is Rachel Tink Trinka. Welcome, Rachel. Good evening. Can you hear me? It's on. Testing, testing. All right. Try. All right. Good evening. Uh, my name is Rachel Trinka, school board and superintendent. You voted on August 9th, 11 weeks ago, on the COVID protocols and mask mandate. I stand before you asking that you add to the agenda on November 22nd, 2021, to review the COVID protocols and vote and vote on removing the mask mandate effective January 3rd, 2020. From the August 16th summer update, quote, the district will review our universal masking requirement regularly. We will consider local infection trends, vaccination rates, and overall influenza-like illness data in determining when the face mask requirement can be removed, unquote. Regarding local infection trends, within Rice County from October 13th through October 23rd, the average cases per 100,000 residents is 225.47, which is 0.23% of the Rice County population. Referring to the dashboard, positive case rates in the Northfield School District since last Monday have been on average 20.75 cases out of 4,400 staff and students. That is an average of 0.47 of the school district. Regarding vaccination rates, 61.7 of Rice County is vaccinated. Referring, regarding influenza-like illness, Referring to the dashboard from October 11th through October 20th, that average is 1.31%. At the August 23rd meeting, it was mentioned that the state gets concerned when the influenza rate reaches the 5% threshold. At that same meeting on August 23rd, you were going to be looking at what would be considered long, long enough to remove the masking requirement. Fast forward nine weeks and here we are. We are here today with no sunset or off-ramp resolutions. Again, I'm asking for you to add to the agenda on November 22nd, 2021, to, remove, to review the COVID protocols and vote on removing the mask mandate effective January 3rd, 2020, 2022. Sorry. It is my duty as a parent, as a community member, as a stakeholder in the Northfield Public School Districts to research and question everything for the sake of my children and to not blindly trust. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Rachel. Our next speaker is Loretta Fossum. Welcome, Loretta. Good evening. I'm uh, speaking on behalf of a granddaughter uh, that goes in, in our school district here. She's a nine-year-old. She has allergies, and since this mask mandate for the, for the course of this year, she is suffering terribly from allergies and on an average missing a couple of days every other week due to having uh, two symptoms of the seven of the protocol on COVID. Um, having to get tested and missing two to three days of school before she can return. It's frustrating and I feel it's harmful. And she has no problem wearing the mask, but she doesn't understand that her illness is most likely coming from having to wear this mask daily, eight hours a day. Um, and that is my concern. And I would like to see that the mask mandate be removed um, because it is affecting our children. And, you know, um, their brain function and everything is somewhat 
compromised from, you know, the difficulty in breathing and, you know, oxygen and um, it's, it's heartbreaking as a grandparent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Loretta. Our next speaker is Jessica Liebrock. Welcome, Jessica. Hello, um, thank you again for the opportunity to speak. It's been a couple months since I've spoken to you. Um, and I just, I wanna start by saying thank you for the continued um, respectful dialogue that I've engaged with several of you. Um, it's, it's a good thing for us to continue this conversation, to push each other's beliefs and to hold each other accountable. Um, and as I said before, I would come back and remind you all that we are looking for an off ramp. Me and, and, and many other parents here are looking for some commitment on when we move um, forward with this. And you know, believe it or not, I still believe that we all agree on more than we disagree. Um, we all want the best for students, for staff, for families, and for our community as a whole. Um, I think we also all agree that our kids deserve better than what we've had to put them through um, during this pandemic. They deserve to be in school, in person, without restrictions, to sit by friends at lunch, to smile at their friends, to see their teachers' faces. And allow me to remind you um, of, of how this has impacted our, our students. For current seniors, the last full normal school year for them was when they were freshmen. This has been their entire high school careers. For our eighth graders, the last normal school year was when they were in fifth grade. They have been dealing with this reality for all of their middle school years. And for kiddos that are in second grade and younger, like my daughter, they have never had a full school year that was normal. And let me share this picture with you. This came home with my daughter last week. And when I asked her about it, she said, it, when you look at me, you see a girl with a mask, but underneath the surface, you see all these things that I am. Kind, curious, athletic. And this has been her reality. So let me ask you, what have, what have we gained from this universal mask mandate, right? Has it been effective in stopping the spread of COVID to the extent that we all hoped? Um, going by the most recent week's numbers and comparing the Northfield School District with Owatonna and New Prague, which have both allowed masking to remain parental choice, there's virtually no difference in the amount of COVID cases amongst those three districts. In fact, Northfield had a 0.5% case rate compared to 0.38% in Owatonna. And Northfield is reporting 23 current cases, while New Prague, which is a slightly larger district, is reporting 22. I was unable to find cumulative data for the entire school year to compare, but I'd encourage you all to take a look at that if you haven't done so already. Um, and I'm sure that there's many here who would be very interested in, in those results. Next week, we expect news of the approval of the Pfizer vaccine for ages five through 11. This is fantastic news for those that want to choose to vaccinate their children. Parents will have the opportunity to, be, to fully vaccinate their kids by the end of December which is why I also am asking that you put this on as a detailed discussion in a November meeting and vote to remove this mask mandate as of January 3rd, when the parents who would like to make this choice have the opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jessica. That concludes our public comment this evening. So we'll move on to announcements and recognitions. Dr. Hillman. Yes, we have uh, one set of announcements tonight that is pretty exciting. For the first time in 20 years, we wanna congratulate the Raider girls cross country team who are the conference champions. So that's the first time in over 20 years that or in 20 years that they have won the conference. And we wanna recognize several individual uh, placers. So Kaylee Graber, an eighth grader, won first place in the individual, uh, champ the individual championship and it was all conference in the big nine. Uh, senior Clara Lippert, sixth place and placed all conference. Addison Enfield, who's in ninth grade, was 10th place and made all conference. Uh, Adriana Fleming, a senior, was 20th and honorable mention all conference. Peyton Quas, uh, seventh grader, 24th place, honorable mention all conference. Claire Casson, a ninth grader, at 26th place. And Clara Menson, who's a sophomore, 34th place. So, congratulations to the Raider girls cross country team on. Uh, historic season and to all of those individual placers uh, and those who uh, earned all conference status. Uh, the boys team placed sixth in the big nine with a great showing and a very competitive field. We want to congratulate uh, Nathan Amundsen who placed sixth and earned all conference for the Raiders. So 
uh, thanks to our cross country runners and their hard work that earned them these accolades in the big nine meet. So congratulations to all. Thank you. Um, so board members, anything they'd like to add? Okay, um, we'll move on to our first presentation tonight, which I am delighted to welcome Principal Nancy Antoine. We're always, always excited to have Nancy here, but she's not doing a site improvement plan. She is here to, um, so that we are able to congratulate her appropriately for being uh, awarded the Minnesota's National Distinguished, Distinguished Principal. So Nancy is here to um, talk about her recent trip to Washington, D.C., to receive this prestigious award, as well as um, we know she will impart a lot of her wisdom on how she is the amazing principal that she is. So welcome, Nancy. Thank you very much. It's, it's wonderful to be here tonight, and I'm honored as well. Um, the role as the 2021 NDP um, it's a it's a it's a full load, but I think I've got broad enough shoulders to to take that on. Um, just a little history on this one. I was nominated back um, last yes last year about this time. I was nominated by uh, Principal Chris Beerkley, and he um, lives up in Bemidji, and he is a principal up in Red Lake Falls, so way up north, which tells you that you know we need everyone, and it's is to be able to connect with other principals across the state all the time. And we can connect on so many different issues and it's really really a, just a treat to be able to work with all the different principals. This past May, we had our final, we had our uh, final interview and that's at the time that I was recognized as the NDP for 2021. This month, and earlier this month on October 6th through the 9th, we were, all of the NDPs from each state were invited to go to Washington, DC. And I tell you, just an experience of a lifetime. I can't, could not imagine anything better. And I'm, I may say this more than once, but I think the, the most important thing that I got out of this, or the thing that really uh, warms my heart is the positive attention that it brings to the state of Minnesota, the positive attention that it brings to Northfield, the Northfield community and to Bridgewater Elementary. And of course, I always look at bringing positive attention to the family name since my dad was the superintendent of schools and he just passed um, uh, earlier this year. So those are four things that I'm really proud of, but most of all, proud that it brings a positive attention to our community, because I think that's really important because we do great things in our community and that needs to be recognized. So one of the things that we got to do as the NDPs, um, the first night we got there, we had a trolley tour and it was a tour of the monuments at night. Had never even heard of that before. Um, and so I thought, well, why not? Why not take advantage of that? And I'm um, so glad that I did. Um, I, it was so meaningful for me because of all the stops that we, that we made um, in honor of our, of our veterans and of our military folks. And to me, that was huge. Uh, most of you know that um, I have a, I've got quite the military background in my family. Um, and my, my youngest sister, my baby sister, as I call her, she's in the military, she's in the army. And yes, she's a colonel, so she's, I think she outranks me now, but don't tell her that. <laughs> She'll get a big head, but no, I'm very proud of the work that she's done. Um, she's been in for, I think she's been in for 23 years now. So she's, she's definitely close to retiring. She'll get to retire before I do, but that's okay, because I'm still having fun. <laughs> um, so that, that piece was, was huge. I'm um, seeing the, like the, the, um, standing in the spot where Dr. Martin Luther King gave his, I, love, I have a dream speech, looking out over the water, talk about just give you goosebumps. That was, to me, that was, that was one, of the, one of the best moments. Um, and then of course, seeing the Vietnam veteran, um, the display there, and then knowing, noting how, when you get out to the Iwo Jima monument and it looks over, overlooks, especially at night, you can see how it overlooks the Washington monument and the Lincoln monument, again, so touching. So that was our, what, what that opened up everything. On um, the next day, we had a chance to get to meet each other, get, get to meet all the rest of the NDPs from across our country. Um, we had a reception there and then we each had to give our speech. And so I would like to share, I'll share a part of my speech, which I think is uh, meaningful for tonight. Um, again, everyone had the opportunity to, many people spoke on, you know, test scores and, and you know, the, 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 their buildings and things like that. And, 
you know, I thought, well, first of all, I started out with my with my thank yous, my thank yous to everyone that was there. And of course, a thank you to my husband, Doug, because without, without a supportive spouse, this doesn't work. And most of you know that my mom has lived with us for the last 25 years um, since my dad's been gone for, for, my dad's been gone for at least 35 years. So she's lived with us for the past 25 years. And she also has made my job possible. So I definitely wanted to give credit to, to the two of them. Um, and bottom line is every successful principal has an amazing family to provide support, encouragement, laughter, and a soft place to land when needed. And we know that happened, that that's needed many times. So um, I was asked earlier, why is it what I do what I do? What's my why? Well, my why goes way back to being born a biracial girl, little girl growing up in a predominantly white community in Northern Minnesota, close to the Canadian border. I have vivid memories of the racist names and comments that were made to me every single day. I remember students on the bus singing Linda Rodstead's song, that one that says, you're no good. Yeah, they sang, they sang that to me every day. I won't listen to it today. I didn't have that teacher or principal to advocate for me or to let others know that this behavior was wrong. When I was a senior in high school, my counselor told me, you're kind, go to the military. Well, I had a different goal and I didn't let his idea replace mine. I knew that if I didn't work hard and go to college, I would be stuck in that small racist town forever. And I wanted my journey to go in a totally different direction. My four sisters and I imagined together how we would get out of the cycle. And we knew that education was a key. While we all took different paths, Right now, I've got a sister who is a vice president of an insurance company. I've got the one who's a colonel in the army. I've got one that, that works risk management out, out at Anderson Windows. I've got, um, um, let's see, it's the other one who works at, she's an RN at HCMC. So there, somebody forgot to tell us we, we weren't so, supposed to be successful. Um, we all took different paths, but my path took me to educating and empowering children because I knew then, as I know now, that students deserve better. I want to provide opportunities for all of my students to be successful, especially my marginalized children. I stand in the gap for all my students and do whatever it takes to promote them. I also want others to know that the thoughts and opinions of others don't get to define them. I take the time to show my students that I see them, I hear them, I know them, and I want them in school. They all have value and strengths, and I notice this. My students and their future are why I do what I do, and I'm proud of what I get to do, not what I have to do, but what I get to do every day. My students are worth it. And don't ever discount a person based on where they're from or what they look like, because one day they too could be standing in front of you. And that was the speech that I gave out there. Um, then that, after for that evening, we got to go to the um, Hay Adams Hotel, which is a block away from the, the White House. So that was, and um, we had the reception upstairs off, out on the back balcony. So that was, uh, again, really neat. Got a chance to meet all these different principals from across the country. And then I realized that many of the leadership for the National Elementary Principals Association, like, wow, I know a lot of these people because I'm working with them on the, the National Race and Equity Task Force. So that was really neat to get a chance to have those informal conversations. The next day, we got a chance to speak to some of the officials from the United States Department of Education. And again, you might think that, okay, well, that was, that's kind of boring. Oh, not for me, not for me. That was an opportunity. And, and as they walked into the room, I'm writing down notes, what I want to talk to them about. I wanted to talk to them about the teacher shortage, our substitute shortage, and all, all the rest of the pieces that are affecting our teachers and our students here in Minnesota and in Northfield talking about the equity pieces. And then listening to, we didn't get a chance to see the Secretary of Education, we got a chance to see the Deputy Secretary of Education, Dr. Cindy Martins, and the Assistant De Deputy Secretary of Education, Dr. Aaliyah Samuels. And to hear Dr. Martins talk about the relationships and how important those relationships with students are. And many of you know, at, at Bridgewater, when you, when you see me there, you'll find the kids. If anyone comes to Bridgewater and they want to know what Bridgewater is about, it's about the kids. It's about the families. It's about the teachers. And, the, and that's the piece. They all, they, all sell the, they all sell the school because they're so special. But you take the time to know the kids. One of the questions I was asked during my interview was, 
how do, how do your how do your how would your students describe you? And I said, well, it depends on this. It depends on the student. They're all different. I have a I have a different relationship with every every child. You know, is it the student that every time I see her, she'll put up a, a number with her hand, and that indicates how many times she's seen me in that day. Unfortunately, today with busy meetings, it was only one. Or is it the other another biracial child in my school that every time she sees you, she says, "Hey, twin." Kids need to see themselves in educators. Or is it the kids that want to tell you about their baseball game or about their volleyball game? So that's the that's the piece that's so meaningful. It's like I can't answer, I can't give you one answer on that because I have a different relationship with all of them. And I enjoy all those relationships. Um a Friday night was our banquet. And so of course my husband got to go along. And of course, he, he asked me the question: Do I have to wear a tux? Yes, you do. I have to wear a full length gown, you have to wear a tux. <laughs> and you no, know, you don't have to wear nylons with that. But <laughs> and he was very happy to go along with the banquet. It was just outstanding. Again, an experience of a lifetime um, to, get the, to get that recognition and the accolades that educators all need to hear. And that's the, that's the part that I bring back to my staff um, is that, that, that piece of the recognition that they deserve because they're doing hard work. This is not easy. There's, there, there is no easy button in education. There is no easy button. Like, just like we know there is no easy button in parenting. As a parent, I know that. And many, many days I'm out there with parents in the morning, letting them know that I understand this is hard. This is not easy, but I'm here to partner with you. So I tell you, I look at these things and I know that, I, I know that part, part of this is, is the celebration, <clears throat> but I know part of it is the work we get to do daily. And last Friday, that whole, that whole thing came full circle for me. Um, I, got a, I, I got a phone or I got a, mess, a Facebook message saying, what are you doing today? What are you doing tomorrow? And I said, well, I didn't, my plans are pretty flexible. She says, I want to go out for lunch with you. Here's a, here's a person. She was my student 30 years ago. And getting to, getting to meet her and sit down and talk with her after 30 years was incredible to realize that as a child, she grew up and at the time we didn't have ACEs scores. Her ACEs score would have been off the charts. And that's the adverse childhood um, experiences. That's what it's about. She comes out, of, she, she is one of 10 children and she, her parents, her mom lost custody of them. And they sent her from Chicago to Minneapolis on a Greyhound bus by themselves, no adults with them. And she was the oldest. She comes from a community where she was raped twice by relatives. And she's, she told me, she says, you were the first person that showed me true affection. And I remember the, the weekend days going out and I went down, to, I went to her house and I, I picked her up and her little, her baby sister. And I picked up a couple of the other girls and I took them places so they could have experiences. I took them to the zoo. I took them out eating. We went to the movies, we would go bowling, things, like, things of that nature. Why? Because I was a teacher and they trusted, they trusted who I was. They trusted what I was doing with them, but they needed experiences. So to sit down with her, on Friday and realize all those things made a difference, tells me that teaching makes such a difference. So I, I, I thank you for the opportunity to speak with you all. And, but I tell you what, I, I, I'm, still, I'm still the normal Nancy Antoine that goes back to, I'll go back to school tomorrow and I'll have a, I'll have a great day with my students and my teachers and my families. But that's, that's, what, that's, the, that's about our, the celebration that we had. And, it was a great it was a great time but again, again i love what i got to do questions that you have oh my gosh thank you um board members questions comments yes amy i saw that you brought your award can you hold it up so we all can see it go to the mic Okay, so this is the this is the plaque that I received. I forget there's a bell. Sorry. And then they gave each of us a bell with our name engraved in that, and then the um, the emblem of the the National Association. Can you read the plaque? Sure, I feel. Yeah, awesome. and ring the bell too. A little like Vanna White here. 
Would you like an A today? Oh, it's definitely a bell. And that's why I keep the, I keep it um, silent. Because <laughs> can you imagine if, if one of the kids got, knew, that, knew that this was in my office? We might have some fun. And can you read the plaque? Oh, sure. <clears throat> so it reads, National Distinguished Principal, presented to Nancy J. Antoine, in recognition of your leadership to assure quality education for children during their early years in school, October 8th, 2021. And the, the signatures are by Paul Winger. He's the uh, president of the National Association and then executive director. Um, and yeah, he, Dr. Franks, it's kind of hard to read his name there, but that's Dr. Franks there. Thank you. You're up. Others, questions, comments? Jeff. Yeah, great uh, talk. Um, I just love your enthusiasm and I can just see you're so excited about what you do and you love what you do and it, it comes across. Mm -hmm. And that's just uh, one of the rewards for the great service that you're providing. So thank you very much and congratulations. Thank you. I love the opportunity working here in Northfield. Other board members? No. Thank you. You have left a legacy not only in the community, but for all of the students that will go around the world and uh, remember you as a teacher, as, as a principal. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And even as a principal, every now and then I get to teach. And that's fun. Claudia. Nancy, I'm jealous that my kids didn't get to go to your school. And I'm so proud of you and I'm proud to be a part of this community. And I'm so glad that now our country can be proud of you too. Congratulations. Thank you very much. And even if, you're, even if your children don't go to Bridgewater, they're in the community. And anytime I get to meet any of our, any of our students, it's just an, it's such a reward. Thank you. Corey. Nancy, congratulations on the incredible honor. Can you tell us how many principals were recognized this year? Yes, there was um, there was about forty principals that were recognized. There's one from each state, and some states did not did not actually submit uh, submit an, an NDP. And then there was um, Ecuador and Ethiopia. It was a good sized crowd. Excellent, Tom. Uh, I'll just echo what everybody else um, has to say, and um, you know, one of your your many functions has been as a traffic director too and so um i hope that's changed <laughs> thank you i'm hoping it changes as well today went very well again you know i i can't it, it doesn't happen in isolation it's due to the work of the of the families staff members and of course our, our kiddos and then with the help of the city and the police department we had um, officers out there both this morning and this afternoon and it worked well so hopefully i don't have to direct any more traffic but yeah, I'll do whatever it takes. Dr. Hillman. <clears throat> so it's one thing to hear Nancy talk about her day. It's another to experience it with her, which I get to do fairly frequently. And you can, it takes, you have to plan about twice as much time to get around the building because of all the hugs that Nancy gets. And I think that's a testament to the love that she shows the children in that building. Uh, she truly loves those kids. And you really want to make a difference for each of them every day. We talk about being a student-centered principal and for all the people here and who are listening at home, Nancy exemplifies what it means to be a student-centered principal, totally focused on their needs, understand that their needs may not start with learning to read, right? Their needs may be something simpler and more basic than that and trying to make sure that they have what they need. I've, I've witnessed her give students clothes, right? Who might need something or make sure that they have access to food in terms of bringing uh, things that they, they need that many people take for granted. But imagine being six and knowing that that's a barrier, right, to be able to access education. Um, traffic director, Tom, good one. I mean, I think that when we talk about servant leadership, it's whatever needs to be done, whether it is creating the master schedule, coaching teachers on instruction, which is, of course, what her principal job really is the core of it whether it be serving lunch, whether it be out in negative 30 weather, making sure that kids get into the right cars. Those are just a few of the reasons that Nancy was selected for this honor. And I can't think of anyone more deserving. It's the most prestigious honor that you can get as an elementary principal. And so I know I speak for our entire administrative team 
uh, and the community when we say, Nancy, we are proud of you. Congratulations. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. You forgot to mention those days when it when it's drenching rain outside. Those are my those are my um probably my least favorite, but we're always trying to forget those, Nancy. I know those are the days when I just need to change of clothes. But thank, thank you for being here tonight, Nancy. And again, congratulations. Thank you so much. Okay, definitely a highlight of our um of our year to date in board member, uh, board meetings for sure. So um, we'll move on now to, um, we welcome Cheryl Hall, Director of Special Services um, in her request to hire an additional non-licensed special education staff person. Welcome Cheryl. Thank you, good evening. Yeah, my document closed on me, sorry. Well, as you have in front of you a request uh, for uh, an additional educational assistant at Spring Creek School, that request is coming forward because of a uh, additional students that have moved into, um, actually a student has moved into the district. And with that, uh, uh, some significant needs uh, come with that student and, and we have a, a requirement to meet that, that need. And the cost of that is in your document. I would um, just point to the cost in the document, Cheryl, of $31,000 is the anticipated cost. About 55% would be reimbursed through the special education revenue. Uh, so the net cost of the district would be $22,606. Any questions? I'm sorry, Amy. So it sounds like the student is already here and this is an immediate need. It is. Okay, so I'm wondering if it would be helpful to you if we actually took action on this request tonight. It would be very helpful. So with that in mind, I'd like to move that we move this to the action. How, what, what's the official language? Um, we just need a motion to approve um, moving the hiring of a special ed assistant to items for individual action this evening. That's exactly what I did. All right, so we have a motion. Is there a second? Second by, I think Claudia's hand was up first. Second by Claudia. So questions or comments um, specifically about moving the motion to an item for individual action? Specific to the- Well, or specific, or any question to Cheryl about the hiring. If there's any questions or comments, I'm sorry. We have a motion in a second and then we can ask questions and then vote. So I know there's a lot of openings right now for EAs. Um, just wondering if how this position is gonna get filled sooner or what well, is the process? Right, the process is that we would post it as, as soon as it's approved. And uh, then once we have applicants, we can move forward with that. We are having success slowly filling our educational assistant openings. Um, there are still a few still vacant and we hope we're able to fill it um, as quickly as possible. And this is in a situation where another EA in a different place can be moved over, is that correct? We wish we had enough people to do that. <laughs> Usually we would, we would do that and we do temporarily move people around or um, reassign other staff uh, temporarily to help out uh, to cover those needs. And it could be that it's um, even somebody from another part of the program or um, another, even another building at times, or if there's student absences, we can sometimes move staff because of that. Thank you. Corey. Are the remaining EA vacancies specific to special education? They are the ones that I oversee. They are, okay. are for special education services. Yes, I know um, beginning of the year, would we have as many as 12 that we needed for to fill? Right, and we're closer to about uh, seven at this okay. time across the district. Yeah, it's it's a continual challenge. And I, I just can't imagine how difficult that is because you have, you have the IEPs that require this and we wanna provide that service for those students and to be able to find the, 
the staff, the trained staff to be able to provide that is really challenging. And I know you're also operating under an incredible amount of mandates and paperwork and all that is required. So um, when Sarah was here, she talked about 800 IEP reviews that needed to take place before the end of December. And, and just that alone is daunting and not to mention the manage of the everyday with students. So you do such an incredible job. And so we know that these requests come to the board and they're, they're um, you know, specific to an IEP or to, to a need. And uh, we appreciate, but also uh, understand the, the um, time sensitivity of this and the pressure that puts on, on you and your staff to ensure that these students are getting the, the services they need. So thank you for that continual effort that you just live every day. You're welcome. Thanks for your comments and your support. So anyone else have any questions or comments for Cheryl? Okay, we have a motion and a second to move this request to an item for individual action. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. We'll move that to individual action this evening then. Thank you so much Thank for your you, time. Thank you, Cheryl. I'm sorry, our next, dis our last actually discussion and report, uh, Dr. Hillman, uh, Superintendent Operations and COVID-19 update. And just as a reminder to board members, there was an updated um, COVID report in the table file that reflected the most current that we have from Rice County on cases. Dr. Hillman. Yes, so uh, start with our normal review of the data. Uh, so we did include the latest update from Rice County, that graph that we've been providing you. We see that they did revise the previous week's numbers up a little bit, um, but the good news is after several weeks and about five weeks of continued uh, increase in cases across the county, we did see our first most precipitous drop uh, from 197 countywide cases October 3rd through the 9th to 139 uh, October 10th through the 16th. So. We are very hopeful that this is finally the peak of the Delta variant as described by epidemiologists. And if you read several Minnesota uh, an analysis of the latest wave, they are many of the, several of the experts are saying we are there hopeful that we have reached that peak and that we are starting to see the decline. And that's a, a one of the that's one of the most significant changes we've seen in those number of cases going all the way back until mid August. So that is good news. Uh, as we share each uh, time, uh, at, we gave you what the data was as of October 20th in the packet. I'm going to share with you just if you take a look at our dashboard as of today, as of this morning, uh, there'll be some cases that come off tomorrow. Uh, but currently, our current cases, remember those current cases are the ones that have been reported to us in the last 14 days. Uh, there are 23 of those, ranging from zero at several buildings to a total, the largest is the nine at the high school. Um, and eight at Bridgewater. Uh, the rest are either under five or at zero. Total cumulative cases so far uh, through this morning uh, for the year was at 70. So that is the latest dashboard piece. And again, the ILI rates have been very good. We've been very pleased to see that in fact, now this was only the 18th through the 20th, that shorter week due to the MEA break, but uh, the calculations that we saw uh, across the district were ranging from uh, nothing at the Area Learning Center. Of course, we're always cautious about that data at the Area Learning Center because comparatively, it's uh, got the lowest number of students. It's under 100 students. So that can swing very quickly uh, one way or the other. But we ranged from 0.65% of ILI at Greenville Park for that week to the high of 1.88% uh, at Bridgewater. And we saw a similar spread in terms of the quarantine rate. We did see uh, just under 10% for that three-day period at Bridgewater and the rest of the uh, areas, uh, rest of the schools range from 0.57% at the NCEC. Again, that's got a smaller end. So as you've seen the data, that can swing a pretty good week to week, uh, but ranging from 0.57% at NCEC, again, up to 946 for that three-day period uh, at Bridgewater. But we are thrilled to see that ILI rate staying in that range that is uh, very acceptable. The cases going down in the county uh, are very good. Um, as I also had shared, we did a recent analysis of our 12 to 17 year old vaccination rate. And uh, very soon that number will be at 65% of students who are eligible within the district having been received both shots. We had, when we calculated that a week and a half ago, we were at 65% at least having one shot. And we knew that uh, many more would be completing that series very soon. So that 63 to 65% range. So that is the data for this report. 
certainly moving in the right direction. We're very happy to see that. Uh, I wanna share with you an update on our COVID-19 testing program that I have shared with you uh, a couple of times. And again, just to go with the fact that we know that as people have been trying to find, especially rapid molecular or rapid uh, PCR tests, that it's been very difficult to find those within the community. Many people having to drive uh, to Lakeville or somewhere else to be able to get that test for their students. And we wanna be able to try to provide that opportunity to our families. Uh, we have received all, to, we, we've had, I'm, I'm not sure I can, I, I don't know enough about supply chain to know whether this is, these, some of these things have been supply chain issues, but we know we have been hung up on some of the materials that we need. So just by way of example, the vault test that we have offered for 16 months or something like that, uh, we're not even able right now to get the bags from UPS to be able to ship them. We have a shortage of those at this point. We did get the Q tests. Now the Q test is what we're gonna start with. That's that rapid molecular test. It's a non-invasive nasal swab that then can be inserted into a reader uh, that can give us a molecular, very accurate um, assessment within about 20 minutes. We are excited. We got all of those materials and then found out that there was an important piece of the calibration equipment that was not shipped. Uh, we talked with the Department of Health and unfortunately they were not able to help us, but thanks to Dorothy Cohen in our buildings and grounds office, she contacted Q directly. And I think a couple of times after saying, may I speak with your manager, uh, the swabs were shipped to us the next day. And so they are now on site. We also had the issue of trying to hire someone uh, to be able to help us with this. Uh, we have been able to hire someone who is going to be able to start later this week. And so uh, our, our initial capacity, because it looks like, you know, it takes about 20 or so minutes for the test to be complete. We're gonna actually do a drive up testing program. So it's gonna be actually right outside the door out here. Uh, there's an indentation in the, in the um, curb where people used to be able to pull in for their uh, small children when they were dropping them off at this daycare center. We're gonna come out to the car, be able to help take the sample, bring it back in. There's a room right next door that we're gonna use to be able to process them. We'll print the results and bring them out back out to folks. Um, so you think about it, the test itself takes about 20 minutes. You gotta stagger the start of people coming through. So when we look at that with one person, we're gonna be able to do about five and a half hour, hours per day to begin with. We're gonna be able to handle about 19 tests per weekday to start. And our intent would be to try to ramp that up as needed. But the good news is many people who've been trying to find a test within our community who have just not been able to do so, uh, hopefully if everything continues to go well, we got other PPE, this person who uh, provides the test has to be in full PPE. That means they have to have a gown, they have to have gloves, they wear a mask, they have to wear eye protection. So making sure we have all the appropriate inventory of all of those things. Uh, so we're hoping to be able to start that later this week. And right now we're focusing that Q test on students who, are, who have one or two of those or two of those less common symptoms or that one more common symptom so that we can make sure that those kids who do have some of those regular ongoing kinds of uh, congestion issues are able to get a test and get back in the classroom very quickly. So we're focusing that Q product to begin with on um, symptomatic students. Now we've also ordered uh, an inventory of something called the bio now antigen test. So we typically don't use the antigen test in the district uh, for a lot of different reasons, but we are adding it to our inventory to be able to do something that we're planning to do called a test to stay program. So this would be students who may have been uh, exposed to someone with COVID-19. They would count as a close contact and we want to be able to keep them at school. So this Binax now test would allow us to have those students rather than quarantine, they'd be able to test each day and that means that they would be able to come to school. We're still finalizing the details on that. We do not have those tests on site yet. And it will take us a little bit once we get those tests to be able to prepare the directions for families and to be able to get those out to them. Um, the goal of this is of course, to further reduce the number of students who have to quarantine within the district. Quarantine is very disruptive to families. And we are really trying to work on that mitigation of making sure that we don't let the virus be able to disrupt our schools in a, in a, in a large way. So. This is another round of the layers of mitigation that we're attempting. And so uh, I thank Anita Ozzie, who has been really instrumental in helping us get the testing program off the ground and I mentioned Dorothy Cohen. So we are hopeful that we will be able to get this going uh, later this week, uh, for sure by next week, it's just a matter of making sure all of the different pieces of inventory align. And so we know for families who have asked for this kind of testing to be available in the community, we're, I, I said this before to several people, this really shouldn't be our job, right? It's not, it really shouldn't be our job to have to provide this kind of testing, but it is a barrier for people and we wanna be able to help remove those barriers. So that is our next step in hopefully putting this pandemic behind us. 
So that is the report on the pandemic portion. Three other items in my report today. The second one is an e-learning plan update. So uh, I don't think any of us want to think about snow yet, but we know that it's coming. We know that it's on the way. And again, several years ago, we started using uh, an e-learning day strategy for when winter weather provides a temporary disruption in our ability to provide in-person education. And so rather than extending the school year into June, we have started, again, prior to the pandemic, we started using e-learning days. In that case, we started with the third closure. Uh, we've had a lot of feedback from people that they at least want to see one Minnesota snow day, right? It's a rite of passage in the state. Um, but we are looking to start uh, e-learning days this year with the second day of winter related, uh, winter weather related school closure. And as we, we met with a team of teachers last Monday to be able to walk through some of these ideas with them and to update our plan. Of course, we've had a plan for several years, but we're updating the plan this fall. And I think the key thing for people is that during the pandemic, we've all experienced a, some longer periods of distance learning. And remember, it's just important to remember, that's not what e-learning days are, right? E-learning days are a bridge. They're a single, they're hopefully a single day. We have had very few times where we've had more than one day where we have had to cancel school due to a serious storm. Uh, but what we look at is a bridge for the day. So working with that teacher team of people, we're finalizing that update to that plan this week. Uh, there will not be, people should not think of this as an e-learning day. So the students who are in the room here, do not need to anticipate that they're gonna be on Zoom from 8, 10 till 3, 10, right? There's gonna be at least one attempt to connect via Zoom during the day. Opportunities for people to be able to connect with their teachers, a little bit different uh, from the elementary to the secondary level. Uh, but we just need to understand that an e-learning day is not what distance learning was. It's a bridge over or through uh, a situation where Minnesota winter weather just doesn't allow us to safely transport students. So we're finishing that up. We anticipate posting that to the district's website uh, later this week. So that is e-learning. And later in the agenda, you know, in previous, the previous to this, we did start e-learning on the third day. And some of the variety of different reasons, one of which was that was part of our contractual obligations. Uh, with the uh, new agreement with the Northfield Education Association, we are starting these on the second day. And so it was also on the school calendar. And so I'm gonna ask you to take an action later in the, in the meeting that was in the packet uh, to be able to allow us to start those on the second day. So that is e-learning. Uh, next part, traffic patterns. So Mrs. Antoine was here before. I can't see if she's still, yet. Yeah, there she is. So we know that for several years, we've seen continued increase in the congestion, uh, specifically around Bridgewater. And then I'm gonna talk about Greenville Park in just a moment. We all know the challenge of Jefferson Parkway, right? With the median down the middle, it can be very difficult to get past, uh, um, especially when the traffic backs up onto Jefferson Parkway. And for a period of time, it backed up a little bit onto Jefferson Parkway. And then in the last couple of years, we see more and more parents driving their children to school. And so this year really came to a crisis point uh, where we are really seeing part uh, the traffic on Jefferson Parkway really just be severely disrupted at the end of the Bridgewater school day. So we had been looking at a plan for uh, prior to the pandemic uh, about reversing the traffic. And there were a number of things that had to happen to do that. Um, we started it today and I wanna reinforce what Mrs. Antoine said. I was there for this morning's uh, drop off. And I was then, and as we said, well, that wasn't the main event. The main event is when people pick up in the afternoon, right? Because there's a lot of people who come there. And so normally what we're seeing is it, what was estimated is Nancy, I think it's pretty fair to say it was usually 30 to 40 cars that sometimes would back up onto Jefferson Parkway. And today, at the end of the day, people started arriving to pick their kids up at 2.35 and school is actually supposed to be out around 3.20. We start to see some dismissal about 3.15, but I arrived about 25 after two and there was already one car waiting uh, for the end of the day. And by about five after three, we saw all the way, the car stacked all the way. Now, when we analyze reversing the traffic, so let me just make sure I explain what reversing the traffic means. Rather than entering the campus on off of Jefferson Parkway, people are entering now off of Highway 246. And if you look at a bird's eye view, which I put in the packet of uh, the Bridgewater site, we count that you can put about twice as many cars onto school district property by reversing that traffic as if you enter off of Jefferson Parkway. So we did by five after three, we had that entire lane, believe it or not, all the way from the beginning of the gym, just before the gym, all the way to 246 full by five after three. 
There were some cars that did stack back onto Highway 246. We counted eight, and they're all in a right turn lane that is quite lengthy. So they were not in in the part. They were not in Division Street. The other piece that we'll work with is if that lane is already full, people who are traveling northbound who try to make a left, that could snarl traffic on, on division, though there is a, a right turn lane that we saw people initially uh, using that to bypass. We had police support. And so just we're gonna recommend to people who are traveling north and wanna try to make a left and we've already got a full lot, just go down to the roundabout and use the roundabout to come back to get into that right turn lane. So the key thing is the roundabout kept up. We could not have made this change. There's just no way this change could have worked if we still had the four-way stop sign. Could not have worked. And so the fact is that with that roundabout, being able to keep traffic flowing, and as our community continues to learn how to use the roundabout, everybody gets a little different level of comfort every time you use it. What I would say is I, I looked at Nancy at the end of that, I'm like, this went really well. And you could just feel, you could see it in the drive. I've, I've seen those drivers before. When you're backed out under Jefferson Parkway, people get nervous, right? They don't want to be, no one wants to be disrupting traffic. I'm from New York and I still don't want to disrupt traffic. It took me years to learn not to, but I mean, it just, you, you don't want to disrupt traffic. So people feel the stress, the people behind them. You know, we've all been in the circumstance where you just feel like, oh, and so that's when just people get frustrated and concerned and that impatience happens. We didn't feel any of that today. Very limited. Some of it with people just learning the new symptom of uh, the new system. Um, so cautious optimism, because we are, we did take some real uh, intentional steps to make a change during the school year. And I want to reiterate what Nancy said during her, uh, her presentation, that this is an example of government agencies working together well. So when we were able, we had to wait to get the final approval from MnDOT, which took a little bit longer. We were hoping to have this ready for the beginning of the school year. Couldn't happen before the school year because we still needed some MnDOT approval. We got MnDOT approval that the city helped us get. And then with the change at MEA break, we were concerned about changing driver behavior because it's easier said than done, right? After people have been doing something this way for so long, it's easier said than done to get the people to change their habits. And so we really worked hard with the city. Um, anybody who didn't know, I mean, if, if a parent who didn't know, I think we sent a total of 10 messages, right? So there were messages that went directly to the Bridgewater families. Uh, there were messages that went to the entire school district community. Uh, Nancy recorded a, a voice message that all Bridgewater families got. It was on KYM and radio, it was in the Northfield News, uh, it was on people's Facebook pages. So we really worked hard to use our cascading communication to make sure everybody knew we, we knew that was good. We still had some people try to make a right come in the outdoor, but that's the way it goes. Sometimes those things uh, can die hard from time to time, but I would characterize it to be a success uh, today. And so um, again, some of the pieces that are really important is having families make sure that having the children get out of the pass of the driver's side. So if they're sitting in the back, make sure that they get out on that side so that they're not trying to cross traffic. If they are crossing traffic, or if they do have to get out on the passenger side, excuse me, we directed them to walk in front of their own vehicle. And we had police uh, assistance and other adults helping that today. Because of course, safety is the number one piece in this. And the kids did a great job today. Uh, so I'm happy to give the board this report. This is an issue that has plagued us for let's just say a little bit of time. We all know it's been plagued us for quite some time. Um, a number of things came together. Again, the city really helped us. They produced the video uh, that we were able to share with folks. They helped us with additional support in terms of police uh, support, traffic management uh, today, and they will be all week. So this is an example of some really quality uh, collaboration between the city and the school district. And hopefully, if every, Nancy, if everything goes as well uh, for the rest of the week as it did today, we're gonna be in fairly good shape. So. Uh, for parents and for former students who have been dealing with that for some time, we're thankful that we are able to finally make this change and we're hopeful that it continues to be a positive uh, thing here. So the other benefit is that students are now dismissing from the gym rather than going outside. So on those days when it is pouring, students can be inside dry until their parents come. Uh, and of course, they, it's Bridgewater, so they're very organized. They've got tags hanging from their mirrors saying the name of the student. There are people radioing in and Kids coming out, it's quite the operation at the end of the day. So Bridgewater does an excellent job of that. So thank you to Nancy. Thank you to Ben Mardig and Dave Bennett and Chief Elliott from the city and uh, Cole Nelson from our team and uh, uh, Tracy Clausen, who they did all of that repainting of that driveway on Thursday. And a lot of things that we were very fortunate. We kept begging for good weather. We got good enough weather to be able to do it. So all of those things came together for a successful piece. So 
thanks to everybody involved with that. And of course you create, you try to address one problem and then we have another. And so we are now working with the city on some increased uh, congestion on Lincoln Parkway near Greenville Park Elementary School. You noticed in the enrollment report that we have a, a significant increase in number of children attending Greenville Park uh, compared to the last couple of years, not the same as what it has been historically. There was well above 500 students for a number of years. We're in that 460 range right now. But we've seen more and more families driving their children. We're seeing some backing up onto Lincoln Parkway. Um, of course, there's a little bit more room on Lincoln Parkway than there is on Jefferson Parkway. There's no median, but it is still creating some issues. We've had some area residents uh, share their concerns. We share those concerns, wanting to make sure that we are thoughtful about it. So uh, Principal Sam Richardson and I did attend the city council meeting last Monday night or Tuesday night, excuse me. Uh, this was an agenda item. The city is gonna move forward with several immediate solutions. It's gonna include re relocating the dynamic speed signs. They're right outside here on second street uh, from when this was an elementary school. And so they're solar powered, so they don't need to worry about electricity but they're gonna relocate those dynamic speed signs that show you how fast you're going. Those are gonna be relocated to Lincoln Parkway far enough so that people see it and slow down. And in fact, talking with Chief Elliott, uh, those kinds of interventions have an 83% efficacy rate, which means 83% of the time when people see that blinking speed and they're going too fast, they actually slow down. Now that does diminish over time, but what you hope is that you get driver behavior uh, into a reasonable a reasonable place. So that's one thing. Um, they're looking at a number of other uh, solutions as well. Um, they're, they are, the city council also directed staff to bring some specific recommendations around things like traffic delineators. So if you think about the bump outs that you might've seen, for example, there are these, rather than a bump out what they are, they're using these uh, probably waist high or chest high uh, plastic um, sticks is what I'm gonna call them, but they're, they're called the delineator. And to really just, again, give a visual to people that you're coming into an area where you need to slow down. They're also looking at adding some uh, pedestrian activated beacons, similar to what we have in front of the high school and in the middle school. Uh, and there's a handful of other things that they're looking at uh, to support cross safe crossing in that area when and when not uh, cross guard, crossing guard services are, are and aren't available. So some really good move on uh, Jefferson Parkway and some work that we have to do on Lincoln Parkway again in partnership with the city. Our final uh, item in the report today is just a super shout out to Northfield Community Action Center. So we know that food insecurity has been a real issue during the pandemic. It's been something that we've all been concerned about. We have heard it uh, very clearly from a lot of our families that they have really struggled. Um, so part of the idea with Northfield Community Education Center, which is the former Greenville Park building was to become again, more and more of a center for the north side of the community. Uh, and in the packet, I included a photo of the new food shelf uh, that is located inside the community ed center. So it will serve families, of course, for free in that area. It's offering a mix of fresh fruits and vegetables, frozen foods, pantry staples, and other essential items. You walk into it, it looks like a convenience store. It's, a, it's in the former teacher's lounge in, in the NCEC, um, but you walk in and it feels like you're in a very small convenience store. And so I think it just is, is a, a very different thought process as opposed to what I think some people might perceive a, a food shelf to be, but uh, the program is outstanding. Uh, we are already seeing, in fact, I just learned today, to begin with, because of the uh, health concerns during the pandemic, they were doing it based on an appointment only basis, which of course can be taxing. That's a, can be troublesome for some people. Um, so they are going to be uh, creating some more regular hours that I understand are gonna start fairly soon. So I just heard that today, I don't have details on that for you, but uh, we're really pleased again, to be able to partner with uh, people in the community partnerships is one of our five strategic commitments. And we're, thrilled, uh, we're, we're not thrilled that we have to do this, but we are thrilled that we have an opportunity uh, to help people who have food secure insecurity, uh, especially those living on the north side. So thanks to the CAC for their good work in partnering us with us to get that going. So with that, that is my operations report for this evening. Thank you. Great report. So board members, questions, comments on the report? Amy. Thank you, Dr. Hillman, for the full report. I have a question about the Q test. Yes. From what you were saying, it sounds like the Q test can only, uh, the machine can only analyze one test at a time. Is that right? Yes, and we have, we have uh, capacity. We have actually 10 machines. Um, we are going to be able to, we're gonna start with four because that's what we think our personnel can handle at, and at one time doesn't sound like, but 
it's the ability to be able to handle those uh, tests simultaneously. So we're going to be starting with four appointments basically per hour. Okay. So how does that add up to 29? 19, I said. 19. So it's five mm -hmm. and a half hours. There's got to be a little, some time for the person's lunch. There's a little bit of time at the beginning of the day and a little bit of time at the end of the day. For a but it's a total per day? Of 19 tests per day. Okay. I'm confused because we're doing four machines. Yep. And they so can do three an hour each. Four per hour. So you're going to start basically, we have it mapped out upstairs. Do you have the, do you have the, with, with us, Anita, the, so you've got the picture. So we're basically going to try to start the first appointment at nine and then about 15 minutes later and then 15 minutes later to again get the staggered start. So we're essentially, so from nine to 10, we're doing four. From 10 to 11, we're doing four. Okay, so you're not, using all, you're not using We're not able to use all, all 10 the, yet. At the same, or even all four Simultaneous. at the same time. We're going to use all four at the same time. It's just going to be staggered. We could start everybody at nine o'clock, right? And have everybody, but then people are going to need to wait a little bit, right? And so rather than people all lining up and waiting, what we decided to do is stagger the start. So the first appointment, I believe, is at 9 a.m., then 9.15, 9.30, and 9.45, again, to give that. And then we're going to start it. We just keep rolling with that. So the intent is to be able to do to start with four at a time. We'll continue to increase capacity as we are able um, and continue to look at some other hours as able. This is how we're going to start it because we want to be able to start it and be able to appropriately handle and we don't want people to be showing up thinking that I'm out of here in 10 minutes. It, it does take a little bit of time. We want people to get the individual attention that they need. Again, we are. this is not something that is necessarily in our wheelhouse, but we've gotten some advice on how to run it and we want it to be successful. We want people to feel like they have some, some kind of individual attention. And with our dedication to continuous improvement, we know that we will, the program three weeks from now will probably look very different than it does when we start it hopefully later this week. Uh, do people make their appointments online then? It's a great question. So to begin with, they are going to call our district office to make the appointment. And so we're using a, a Google form that's going to allow us to be able to, uh, to start with. We want to be able to talk to people on the phone to make the appointment with the intention of being able to transition it to an online registration within just the first little bit. Again, we want to start slow and be able to have that individual conversation with people and then release it as we move ahead. And that's the same person or people who will be doing the tests or answering the phone? No. So our okay. district reception uh, line will be able to handle those calls. Yeah, I imagine there'll be a lot of people early in the morning who are hoping to get their kids to school. And so I think as you learn more, you'll probably need to front load the testing a bit to get those early morning people. That's the goal. And our hope, again, the difference is of having something in town be, between in town and having to leave a town to be able to get it, we think is going to be helpful. And we also, you've heard, I mean, we, we are struggling with some uh, employment areas, right? And our educational assistants are one of them. So uh, being able to start this is also uh, dependent upon um, how we can make sure that we have the staffing to be able to run it. Okay. And we're very, we're very thrilled with whom, who we got to start this thing. So it's, it's going to be a very good start, but we, we have five and a half hours a day that we're able to start it with, and we're going to try to maximize that. But we also need to understand that, that you know, we're going to need some time to be able to process the tests and Again, start slow and then hopefully speed up as we move ahead. Thank you. Other questions? Jeff? Yeah, on the testing, give me an example of what we're doing now as opposed to then using yeah, the testing and, and then, you know, what the difference is going to be. Yeah, so in an example where you have, let's say, a, a, you know, a fourth grader um, who has uh, some congestion, you know, a runny nose, um, maybe they have a little bit of a cough, right? And so they'd meet the decision tree criteria where they have a couple of symptoms, just using those as an example. Typically what they would have to do is in order to be able to, they, they would be asked to go home, right? Because we're trying to prevent any kind of um, spread at school. We know some of the, most of the, in fact, most of those cases are not COVID cases, right? But those are a couple of the symptoms. So those families would go and get a test. Now you can get some tests in town, but not always. Sometimes you have to go to Faribault. Sometimes you have to go to Lakeville. If you use something like the vault test, which can be effective, but it takes two or three days. To, that's a mail-in kind of test, right? So you have to take the, the saliva test. You send it home. You send it off, and um, it takes a couple of days to get those. 
So that is the part where right now you can have a student who might have to be home for a couple of days until they get those test results or a physician can also give what's called an alternate diagnosis. So when we get those results, that student can come back to school. With the Q test, the student won't have to leave the community. They'll have something right here, uh, right next door as a matter of fact. And once they get that test result, they can be able to go back to school once they're feeling better. So that's the, that's the difference in what we had before and what we're gonna have. And it does, it's fascinating because we know there's a, you'd think that there's a lot more testing capacity, but we think that there's a number of things just with the way that the labs are processing the test, a reduction in the number of people compared to what we had say uh, at the height in early summer. Uh, and again, what we want to be able to do is try to remove barriers, you know, from folks. And I just do want to remind people that we did get a grant uh, from the Minnesota Department of, I think it's the Department of Health gave the grant to be able to pay for some, the tests are free for us, which is good. Um, they gave us a grant to be able to help with some staffing and things like that. So that's what we're spending that grant money on to begin with. And again, if we need to, our hope would be able to, we could ramp that up a, a little bit more quickly as well. We have, we have probably seven or eight people trained. Um, but those people typically all have other full-time jobs, but they could be able to step in and help out on an emergency basis as needed. You think you're able to test the people that want to be tested? Or you don't know that yet. Um, I, my perception is no. I, I, I think that 19 tests is a, is a great thing. That's good. Um, but what I can tell you is I don't think that that's probably always going to be enough, right? So our, we are not intending to replace the testing program in the community. That's not what our intent is. Our intent is to add on uh, so that we can try to provide some additional service. And if we can ramp up further, we'll certainly look to do so. But again, we wanna start start small because this is not something that we, this is not necessarily our area of expertise to begin with. We've gotten some great advice. We've had some support from, of course, our local partners. Um, so we'll start slow to go fast, Jeff. Other questions, comments? I have a couple Claudia. questions. Um, so you, it says in your report that it will start on or around the 28th. And so when you are ready to start testing, how will you let the community know? Yeah, so we'll use our, the same way that we typically share with folks. So we'll use our Skylert system and it will either be an individual, depends on if it's ready by the time our family update goes out this week. Otherwise, it will be multiple messages. It will start most likely in a family update. We'll provide multiple messages. The messages are all translated. Um, as you know, anytime that we send a district-wide message, not only do our Spanish speakers get that message uh, in print, they also get a voicemail phone call. Marval de Contos, our district's translator, helps us with that to make sure that uh, those families get this in multiple ways. We'll, of course, use our social media sites what KYMN know. And then I think the other part is it's gonna be very retail in terms of if there's a student who's called in, you know, the school office may say, hey, if you call the district office, you will probably have a chance to get an appointment. So we'll use a variety. I'm not terribly worried about, I think this is the kind of thing that people will know pretty quickly that it's available. And I think I, I'm hopeful, maybe I'm wrong, but I'm hopeful that we actually have less desire than what I think we will. But I'm worried that we, well, we know 19 appointments is probably not going to be enough to start, but it's it's a, it's a value add compared to what we have in the system already. Mm -hmm. um, I had another question separate from the um, COVID. I was curious to hear how um, the Bridgewater traffic pattern changed when the vehicles were stacked in the driveway. And so the one closest to the sidewalk, you know, the student is getting out and getting on the sidewalk immediately. And if they're on the other side of the car, they're going around and in front of their own vehicle. How did it work for the car next to them? They're, yeah, they're not double stacked. Oh, okay. So it's a single line. So there's okay. a there's a single line for drop off, and then there's a passing lane, right? Okay, so okay. you're not we're not double stacking yet to drop off. I hope. Oh, it's a pass. That, that is okay. not what we're. That would not be what we would want to do. So it's a, the, the inside lane is specifically for the drop off, and then the outer lane is for people who are that they can exit that unloading zone, loading or unloading, and then they can just keep moving toward the exit. Tom. Uh, some questions about the, the traffic and um, I'd like to thank Mayor Pownell and the city for their quick work on, on this. Um, so for the Greenvale, the moving the speed sign, does that speed sign change? So it's usually 30 miles an hour there, except during school times when it's 20, does it change to flash at the 20? 
and then switch back to 30? Yeah, I, my understanding, Tom, is those can be programmed. And my understanding is I think that they are programmed to only be on during the school day. At least that's at Spring Creek where we have the other set of them that we use in, in front of the middle school. You'll notice that the, the signs do shut off at a certain time. So my understanding is that they can be programmed and I, I do not know the details of how the city programs those. My, I would assume that we could do it in a variety of different ways. It, it seems like there's always things going on over at that Greenville area that, you know, until well, I was behind someone who's going a little fast in, the, in um, on Lincoln Speedway, I mean, Lincoln Parkway um, tonight. So, um, and, and, and that was at 5.30. So maybe if it went to six o'clock or, well, I mean, they can look into that. Yeah, and I, I know we're working with the city, first of all, and trying to get those relocated. Again, like everything else, it's not, that's a specialized skill, right? I mean, in terms of it, does, you, you think, well, just move them. Well, it's not how it works, actually, right? It takes a, a, a group of people who have the equipment and the know-how to be able to, you know, to install those properly. My understanding is they were fairly close to be able to get a contractor to do. We know what, it, what it's like right now to get a contractor to do right. a lot of anything. It's just the, the backup and work. People are just very busy. And so we know that people look to schools and try to help them. But even with that, that is just something that we just know that there's more work than those contractors can handle right now. And then the, the things that are being done, um, if that development proceeds in that area, these are just well, not temporary, but it'll all be looked at again, I assume, in the future to, and make adjustments. Yeah, so I think that was something that the city council was pretty clear on. Um, some of these things that could be additional, the, the piece like moving the dynamic speed sign, that's, uh, that's done. That's going to happen right. as soon as it's not done. It's going to happen as soon as it can practicably. But things like the delineators and things like the pedestrian activated beacons, uh, and they have not approved it yet, right? But the council was pretty clear in their discussion that if uh, things were implemented before that property was developed and there was a need to change it, that their expectation will be that we would change it then, that not we, but the city mm -hmm. would change it afterwards. And so uh, we know that uh, there are some additional studies going to happen in that area. Uh, and I do feel confident that if there's something that's implemented beforehand that the city and the school district together have a commitment to making any changes necessary after to ensure that that area is as safe as practicable. And can they put deer crossing signs? Because I came that close to hitting one the other night, right in front of Greenvale. <laughs> so again, this is one of those things that is out of my, my uh, center of skills. Uh, we'll have to defer that one to the city, Tom. Other questions, comments? Amy. I'm still, uh, thinking about the Q test, how does HIPAA apply to all of that? Like, we'll know some medical piece of medical information about these people. Can we tell ourselves that piece of information? Can, and so there is a piece that they sign off on uh, at the beginning. You know, it's I think there's a piece where you're coming to us to provide us the test. We, we're using the Q system. We are handing them a piece of paper as opposed to emailing them their results. Um, so we've worked with the department, we're following the Department of Health guidance on how to implement a school-based testing center. No. I would like to comment a bit regarding- Oh, well, can you just pull your microphone down? There you go. I'd like to comment a bit regarding the, uh, what's that sign called? A the dynamic speed dynamic sign. Dynamic speed yep. sign. Um, I live on Linden. And there is traffic going, uh, there are pedestrians on Linden almost day and night. We have a motion detector that helps light the way and it's on most of the time because there are a lot of people walking or biking in that area. So I would be thoughtful if it were my decision about the dynamic, the, the speed limit is set on the dynamic sign. And, and if there's any way to be able to activate that dynamic sign from the Linden, uh, the, you know, the Linden crossing of, of the, of the, uh, of Lincoln. Thank yep. you. Linden and Lincoln. And so now I know you're talking about the other kind of sign, though, which is actually there's apparently there are four or five different kinds of signs you can get with this. What you're talking about is the pedestrian activated beacon. So that's where I come to the corner of Lincoln and Linden. I'm on Linden. I'm going to cross Lincoln. I press a button. All of a sudden, these yellow lights start blinking, so that people know that I'm going to. Uh, I'm going. 
those would be available the entirety, right? Once they're in, once they are uh, installed, they would be able to be used regardless of the time. The dynamic speed signs again. What they do is they will gauge a vehicle speed as they enter, and if it is above the the predetermined speed zone, it's not necessarily a limit. But for example, it's signed at 20 miles an hour when children are present. If it's above 20 miles an hour, that starts to blink. And so um, the pedestrian activated beacon, which is really to assist people crossing the parkway uh, when there aren't crossing guards present, if those are installed, if the, again, the city council hasn't approved those yet, um, but they indicated a strong desire to do so. If they, when they do, those would be available 24 seven. Well, there is a, a goal of trying to see how fast you can go around that curve without squealing your wheels. So well, it, it's kind of a, it's an awkward, awkward situation for a lot of reasons. There's a church there, there's pedestrians there, there's a school there. Um, the and I'm fairly certain that's been for, for much longer than the new building has been there been there as long as Lincoln has been there. Yes. But it's exasperated because there's more traffic now, or more right. pedestrians and traffic than there were. So anything we can do to make that much safer, you know, I, as I said, I if I were a crossing guard, I'd raise my life insurance. Thank you. Thanks, Joel. Other questions, comments? I just had a, a couple of questions. We just um, to uh, um, talk about first the the uh, traffic. I don't know if board members have had a chance to be at the high school when it releases to see the new crosswalk and how incredibly incredibly well that's working. That was really great to see. Um, so I just appreciate all the attention to this and and thinking about when we were able to work with the city when they put in the roundabout to add that crosswalk at the high school and how important that has been for our student safety at the high school. Um, in terms of the COVID-19 testing program, just thank you for all of the work on that. When uh, and, and initially just a demonstration of our stewardship and our ability to just say, no, we will we will make this work. The state released the grant opportunities and there was only about 30% of the districts that said they wanted anything to do with it. So um, we were on it and we're given the grant money. Um, since then, uh, most of the districts have seen the light and realize it's a testing program is something you have to do again reluctantly, but it's important. We know it's going to be a game changer in terms of our students, especially the test to stay program. But I just want to acknowledge that our district was um, you know, one of only 30%. So 70% of the district said, yeah, no, thanks. Um, and so I just really appreciate that we went after those funds around a little over $200,000, which, which is, um, you know, a significant amount of money. It allowed us to hire that individual and to really work through the details. So I just appreciate the attention to all of the details. It's, you know, just the logistics as always devils in the details and um, just to make it work. Cole, Dorothy, Anita, yourself, Cheryl, everyone that that had a, a hand in making sure that it's going to be successful. And we understand there'll be some kinks that have to get worked out in terms of how it flows, but boy, it, it's just really going to be excellent. And then my last comment would be about the e-learning day update. And I think it's just a real demonstration of how much we have learned about technology and how we're able to interact with students. And we're fully leveraging you know, Zoom and Seesaw and Schoology and our talking points and, and um, you know, our, our staff's ability to, to connect with students, which is what we learned. Um, you know, so, so it's definitely a silver lining and, and um, districts talking, you know, state officials talking about districts being able to learn from that. And this is just a demonstration of, of that. And, and I just, again, appreciate how we are really, how much we learned and how we're able to leverage everything we learned on to really ensure that our, our students are getting the best experiences possible on those days when, when they aren't able to be in school. So, so with that, I think we have, that's, that's, That's the report, so thank you. Um, so that, that is um, our last report for the evening. So we can move on now to the approval of the consent grouping. As a reminder, there were a few personnel items in the table file that were added to the consent grouping. Is there anything anyone would like to pull from consent for separate consideration? I do wanna just make one comment yes. uh, on 
in the the uh, consent agenda, the minutes from October 11th inadvertently under the area of committee reports, uh, we missed the word no. There weren't any committee reports. We said that there were committee reports, but didn't get it. So we just, it was just a typo. We did not include the word no. So the minutes that are part of the consent grouping should be modified just to reflect that there were no committee reports at the October 11th meeting. Okay, thank you for, thank you for making that um, clarification and for whoever spotted that, that was a good catch. Um, so there isn't anything anyone would like to pull. Is there a motion to approve the consent grouping? Moved by Jeff, is there a second? Second by Corey. All those in favor of approving the consent grouping say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. We'll move on now to items for individual action. We do have three this evening. Um, before I ask for a motion on the first um, item for individual action, which is the pay equity implementation report, I'll just ask Dr. Hillman to give a brief overview of that. I'll ask for a motion and then we can ask for questions and comments on that. Dr. Hillman. Yes, as you recall, uh, school districts across the state, um, as well as many other entities, are required to submit the pay equity report once every three years. I, in January, you approved our uh, January 2021. You approved the initial submission of that pay equity report, and we knew we told you there was a strong possibility that we would not pass the salary range tests. That tests the years that it takes an employee to move from their beginning salary to their maximum salary. Uh, we eventually as the state then, once you approve submitting it, the state reviews it. And as we had predicted, we were not gonna be able to pass that test at that point. Uh, we did uh, an implementation plan that included working with the Northfield Education Association uh, to modify our salary schedule to reduce the total number of steps from 15 to 10. That was one of the strategies that was suggested for us to be able to, uh, along with a handful of other minor modifications uh, to be able to come into compliance with that. So after working through that, we went back and worked with our consultant, uh, Kathleen Murphy, again, to do some preliminary analysis, and we are going to, we're required to submit the plan again. And so, again, we're simply asking you tonight to approve the submission of the implementation report. The state will then review it, and based on our analysis, we believe that the state will approve our implementation report. So I just need to ask you to officially approve the submission of that report this evening. Okay, thank you. So I will ask for a motion to approve the pay, pay equity implementation report as presented. Moved by Tom, is there a second? Second by Corey. Any questions or comments? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Our next item for individual action is the adjustment of the e-learning day as Dr. Hillman outlined in his um, superintendent update. So is there a motion to approve the adjustment of e-learning day starting point from the third day closure to the second day, second full day closure as outlined? Moved by Claudia. Is there a second? Second by Amy. Any questions or comments? Okay. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. We will now make the motion um, for the item we added to individual actions. So is there a motion to approve the hiring of a special education assistant at a total projected cost of salary and benefits of 31,000 with approximately 55% of the salary reimbursed through special education revenue for a net cost of $22,606. Moved by Claudia, is there a second? Second by Amy. Any questions or comments? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Oppo or, uh, opposed? Motion carries. Um, that is it for items for individual action. We'll now move to items for information. Um, a bright spot for sure in our uh, enrollment options and history report, Dr. Hillman. Yes, I'm gonna invite uh, Director of Finance Val Murdostorff to assist me as needed through the uh, presentation here. Uh, so at this time every year for many, many years, we've presented to you something called the Enrollment Options Report. Uh, several years ago, we added something called the Enrollment Options History Report. So the first part simply takes the annual look and compares last year to the current year in terms of enrollment. And we look at it in a number of different ways. We look at Northfield students who are going to other schools. So 
Minnesota has one of the most sophisticated systems of public school choice uh, in the country. And so students have an option to choose an, uh, um, another traditional public school. They have an option to select a public charter school. Of course, they could choose a, a non-public school or they could choose homeschool. And so we do that analysis each year. We provide you every single location where students go to as a Northfield resident and every single location that they come to as an open enrolled student. So when we take a look at, we all know that last year's data was very interesting. We saw nationally a significant reduction in the number of students attending uh, traditional public schools as families made a lot of different decisions based upon the uncertainties associated with the beginning of the pandemic. When we take a look at last year to this year, last year we had 875 students choose some school other than Northfield. So those are 875 school district residents who chose something different. They could have chosen uh, one of the fine two charter schools that we are the authorizer for. I wanna remind people we're one of only two remaining public school districts in the state that go through the rigorous process of authorizing charter schools. So they could choose uh, Prairie Creek or they could choose Arcadia. Some of them choose a number of other different charter schools. They could choose a non-public school like St. Dominic, another great partner that we have here in the community. And we have long had an excellent relationship uh, with our homeschool families as well. Uh, we provide some options for shared time enrollment where uh, homeschool families can have their students attend school for certain specific courses, most often as they get older. So you can take a look at last year, we had 875 students attend someplace else. This year we had 853 chose to attend somewhere else. So that uh, went down by 22 students this year. And we also see that we stayed very similar. So this year we had 454 students coming to our schools from other traditional public school districts compared to 455 last year. So that remained, I think we can call that stable. So you can see all the, of the lists of places where students attended. You can see again, the 2021 to 21, 22 comparison. Um, you'll see the total non-public last year, we had 153 students choose a non-public school this year, 128. When you look at homeschool students, you'll see that last year we had a total of 207 students choose homeschool from 94 families. This year, 180 from 85 families. When you look at students going to charter schools, we saw an increase in that this year from, from last year to this year with 278 resident students choosing um, charter schools last year to 287 uh, this year. We saw an increase at Arcadia. That could be possible that some of those families last year chose to homeschool. There are residents, so they would have uh, op been under homeschool last year and now are going to one of the charter schools. That's a possibility. Uh, second page of that report shows you the students in and out of each school district. Once in a while, you'll see a, a student where you say, well, geez, how could a student, for example, attend Wilmer? You know, how could they come here from Wilmer? Once in a while, what we'll see is we'll see where there's a parent who has custo uh, custody of a child. And for whatever reason, there's a temporary piece where that student will come here for a period of time. So when you see an outlier like that, well, how could someone drive from Wilmer every day? That is typically, it's typically has something to do with a custody related piece and the student um, still the custody of the official address would still be in that community that seems further away, but they are staying with either a non-custodial parent. They may be staying with a grandparent. There could be a, a variety of different reasons. So you can see um, all of the students who have um, come in this year versus last year. Then the second part of it is the enrollment option history that goes back uh, a decade. So it goes back to 2011, 12, and again, what you'll see is when we take a look at that, um, last year we had a deficit of, we've long had a deficit. And again, I think a lot of places look at those deficits as, as something that's a problem. Um, of course, those students would bring, generate revenue and come to Northfield Public Schools. But we've long been a leader in public school choice by us, what used to be called sponsoring, now authorizing charter schools. So you'll see that we did decrease the number of students, the net, the net loss of students from 420 last year to 399 this year. So that uh, is an improvement. Um, we, we have been projecting declining enrollment anyway, right? We've been sharing that with that with you for several years now. Um, and the fact that we're, you know, we're still, we still increased, we're better this year than we were last year, I think uh, does say that we're holding our own in that enrollment options area. Val, that's my analysis. Do you have any other words of wisdom to share as you're one of the chief Chris Nesset, 
our student information systems person is, is uh, really generates the bulk of this report bit, but Val, who's responsible for sharing our enrollment with the state does some analysis as well. I think you covered it really well. Okay, we try to be thorough. Yep. What questions might people have about this year's enrollment report? Amy. I noticed that in the last 10 years, we've more than doubled the number of students that come from Faribault. Yes. Here, is that mainly because of the program at the ALC or is there something more to that? Yeah, I think that for as many people, there's probably as many reasons. I wanna just be clear, you know, we have less than a total of a hundred students at the Area Learning Center. I think we're I think about 90 this year, Val, roughly. So we saw the most pre precipitous change in this in 2017, 18, if I recall. And I think for the uh, residents who are coming to, from Faribault, there's as many reasons as there are people. For some people, they live very close to the line, you know, of the district. There's, we see that with Cannon Falls. We also see that with New Prague. We see where some people just, they, they go to church in a different community. They go to the grocery store in a different community. So even though they're technically within our school district, they might choose that district or vice versa. There are people who live close enough. They say, well, we typically interact in Northfield, so we're going to take our student there. So to try to characterize, I do know that the Faribault Public Schools have done some uh, research on this. They've, in the last couple of years, they really have looked at it to see what is causing. And um, I think that they have really looked at some perceptions of some of the programming, and they're working very hard to share the real quality programming that they have with their community. But again, for as many families as choose it, there's probably as many reasons. It seems like three over 300 students from Faribault is a significant part of their population. And a significant part of ours. Thank you. Jeff. What's the flip side on going from here to Faribault? So for in 21-22, we have 309 students coming from Faribault to Northfield. We have four students going from Northfield to Faribault. And can I just comments on Randolph because that seems to be a yeah so you know we've seen we saw an increase uh, in students who have gone to we've seen an increase of but take a look at the enrollment options history so you'll see an increase of students who have gone to Randolph uh, for several consecutive years if you look at the top the Northfield students out so you'll see that you know in from 2018 19 to 2019 20 we went from 59 to 72 and then it was and that's you know that's been stable for the last couple of years. Uh, to be clear, Randolph adopted some different safety protocols uh, than we did this year, and we had a number of families who specifically told us that was the reason that they chose Randolph. I think the other piece, I, I sign all of those documents that go out, Jeff. The other piece is that there are uh, many times where what's written on the document prior to the pandemic, right? People really, in some cases, people really looking for that more rural school feeling in terms of just some what they perceive to be smaller class sizes. There are some different programs that Randolph has that we don't. We, of course, are blessed with many different programs, but sometimes a, a smaller school district might specifically have a very successful agricultural program that we've partnered with them for several years on. And we send our some students to Randolph for the first couple of periods of the day. After sometimes we see some people who really like the, the school, and so they choose to go there. We're, we're is we're very fortunate to have outstanding school districts all around us. And so you see that um, you're going to see all of these people who make choices to go to different places. I think it reinforces the fact that Minnesota already has the most sophisticated system of choice in the country. And so uh, we're leaders in that in many ways. And so we, there are already plenty of choices for people. Any other questions or comments? Thank you for this report. It's always really uh, a valuable one to, to know where our, where our enrollment is. Um, so that is it for items for information. Future meetings, we have quite a few in November. Um, Monday, November 8th, just prior to the 7 p.m. regular school board meeting, we will have the world's best workforce presentation that will begin here in the district office boardroom at 6.15 p.m. Again, then followed by the regular school board meeting that same evening, Monday, November 8th at 7 p.m. Thursday, November 18th at 5 p.m., we are confirming the board work session. That will be at the district office conference room 105. And then our uh, second board meeting of the month of November will be Monday, November 22nd at 7 p.m. here um, also in the district office boardroom. So with that, I ask uh, thanks to everyone for a great meeting. 
um, and to our audience members for you what observing us do our, our vital work. Um, I ask for a motion to adjourn. Moved by Noel. Is there a second? Second by Jeff. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. We are adjourned.